Welcome to this post-landing news conference for Space Shuttle Atlantis' STS-132 mission to the International Space Station. Joining us here at NASA's Kennedy Space Center are three NASA managers who will give us the latest on Atlantis' 12-day mission and following this morning's landing here in Florida. First, we have NASA's Associate Administrator for Space Operations, Bill Gerstenmeier. Good morning. To his left is Space Shuttle Launch Integration Manager, Mike Moses. Good morning. And finally, we have the Shuttle Launch Director, Mike Leinbach. Good morning. We'll start with comments and then uh, open it up to questions. Mr. Gerstenmeier. Thanks, Howard. It's great to be here again. Uh, I can't say how great the overall shuttle station team really performed during this mission. Uh, you know, it, it looked easy on the outside, but I can tell you the behind the scenes work was very intense. The teams were focused. Um, they just did a super job. Uh, they had a great attitude. They even had a little sense of humor throughout the mission, which was excellent, and uh, it worked out just really well. The vehicle on the runway looked really, really clean. You know, it, it's hard to tell when you look underneath exactly what you, you know, if you see any small nicks and things, but it looked as probably as clean as I've seen any of the shuttle vehicles we've had. And uh, things looked really good. We had a little gap filler that, that popped out. Uh, we got some images of that, which will be good boundary layer transition data for us, and that's, that's very important. So, again, I, I want to really uh, take my hat off <coughs> to the teams that have just done a tremendous job of getting the vehicle ready to go fly. And then the execution on orbit was just phenomenal. And it, it's not only the teams here, but it's also the teams in Russia that built a, a pretty nice module. The things I talked to you about at the pre-launch conference where I was a little concerned about some of the ARM activities and using and birthing the new uh, MRM-1 module to the space station, that all worked out tremendously smooth. And, and that's really a tribute to those teams that did a tremendous amount of testing in, in Moscow and the U.S. So again, my hat's off to the team. They make it look easy. I can tell you it wasn't easy, and, and they deserve a lot of praise and congratulations for what they've done. Thanks. Mike? Yeah, I can't, I can't echo much more than that. Uh, it really was an amazing mission. We were joking on the way over here that uh, it's getting to be rhetoric now that we tell you that the, the vehicle that we just saw is one of the cleanest we've ever seen, but that's actually the truth. Each one is just getting better and better. Um, it's a real testament to the, uh, to the folks that went through and all the redesign work that happened after Columbia to really, uh, to really take care of the external tank and, and effectively eliminate foam shedding that can cause damage uh, that we're concerned about. You know, there's still a little bit of popcorning that happens that we know about, and you could see some of those marks on the vehicle, but nothing at all in the realm of uh, anything we, we are concerned with. So again, a, a real testament to the, uh, to the teams here at Kennedy who put the vehicle together, the launch team who gets it into orbit, the folks back at Johnson who plan out the mission, execute it, uh, train the crew, the crews that execute it, and our martial propulsion elements uh, really do rise to the occasion, and they're kind of the unsung heroes of, uh, of getting us into orbit and, and letting us, again, focus on the mission and, and get, the, get the job done at the station. As Bill said, the Russians uh, built a very nice payload with the MRM module. Uh, looking forward to having that activated. And, uh, and then we also talked a little bit about the gap filler that stuck out. It protruded. I forget the actual height, but it was pretty small. But uh, we had the folks from Langley Research Center uh, supporting us with the, the HITHERM project, which is an aircraft that basically has some thermal imaging cameras on it that kind of fly along the flight path and try to catch a, a shot of the shuttle as it, as it comes through the atmosphere and uh, up at about Mach 20 or so. And they got some good imagery. Um, you know, we did that on, on OV-103. Discovery has a, a tile that we intentionally have a bump on it to trip that boundary layer as a research project. So this gap filler kind of served the same purpose as an unintentional uh, chance to gather some more data. We were fortunate to have that aircraft ready to go and, and image image the vehicle, and they did capture good data. So that's you know a unique research environment. Uh, not many aircraft fly at Mach 20 through the atmosphere, so uh, so the shuttle provides a unique chance to, to gather that data. Um, and then you can stretch back just beyond this mission. So not only is this mission fantastic, but the entire life of Atlantis, uh, the folks who built it, uh, all the missions it's flown over its career have been just amazing. Uh, and so, so I, I can't, I can't even begin to talk about uh, how proud I am of of Atlantis and the whole team that, that put it together. So, uh, from a program standpoint, we didn't really have anything to talk about today on landing. The weather was was just perfect. Um, you know, we kind of talked that this storm out in the Atlantic was either going to give us a big band of clouds and showers that we talk about forever, or there'd be a nice opening and we didn't really need to worry about it. And that's what we got today. It was a nice little opening to, to not worry about. So we were really happy there to not only launch on time, but land on time. That's that's a fun thing to do. So with that, uh, I'll turn it over to Mike. Okay. Well, thanks, Mike. Uh, as Bill and Mike said, the vehicle looks really, really good, really, really good out on the runway. I uh, saw just a couple little dings. We'll get uh, a good close inspection of those areas this afternoon when we get back into the OPF. 
Uh, we should get towing underway in the next three or four hours or so and, and uh, get back into the OPF and start the processing for the launch on need mission. Um, the team has got the plan all put together for that. We'll start executing that uh, tonight and that'll go extremely well and uh, we'll see where that, where that takes us over the next couple of months. Um, I'm always amazed by the sight of the orbiter on the runway. Um, it's one of the best things we get to do here at the Kennedy Space Center is go walk around the orbiter, uh, talk to the crew when they get off, talk to the ground crews, the process, and, and turn the vehicle around. It's just an amazing machine. It's, it, it's, a, it's a testament to America's uh, prowess in space that we're able to, to reuse the spacecraft over and over. And it's just a beautiful machine to see out on the runway. And we got to see it uh, up close and personal again today. I'm going to hate to see that uh, go away, but uh, today we got to see her up close, and Atlantis is beautiful. And uh, we'll start the processing for LON this evening. Thanks. We'll now open it up to questions. Please wait for the microphone. When, please, when you get it, say your name, news affiliation, and uh, to whom you'd like to answer. have your question answered. We'll start on this side over here and work our way down. So with Stefano. Yes, uh, Stefano, Stefano Colidan for RAI Italy State uh, Television. Um, I have, a, unlike my questions usually, a long one this time. <laughs> um, for, any, for anyone, Mr. Gerstenmeier or uh, the other. I was, I think today was, you know, looking at the past and the future of the space program because Atlantis is down possibly forever. You make it sound almost like uh, it's going to fly again, but <laughs> talking how good it looks. Um, other ships will follow uh, soon, and the space station is built. Now, uh, I remember when the shuttle program started, there were officials that were saying that uh, the, the vehicle actually could be used to launch components, to be assembled in orbit, to build spacecraft that would leave Earth orbit to carry astronauts to other celestial bodies, etc. Um, I realized that the ships are old and uh, they don't have an escape system. Uh, I was wondering though, if the shuttle had an escape system, if you could turn that cabin into a cabin that can be expelled uh, in case of a Dis launch disaster or in other, any other point in the, in the flight. Uh, wouldn't it be this the uh, reasonable, economical way to go instead of just retiring everything and waiting for we don't know what? Thank you. Well, let's see. I guess I'll, I can take a crack at it. Um, and it, it really comes down to the, the, the budget that you have. And, and from a technical standpoint, you could make any launch system work. You could go retrofit the shuttle uh, to give it an escape system, doing so in the existing architecture would would take a significant chunk of its payload capability uh, in terms of the, the mass it can lift to orbit. The fact that it's a reusable spacecraft means we take a lot of mass up and then back down again. Um, and so, so from that standpoint, if your purpose is to just purely put mass into low Earth orbit, uh, the fact that you use a reusable craft for it, you, you pay a cost. You then hopefully gain that back in a life cycle cost that, that is a cheaper thing to operate. So y that really is the trade space you end up looking at. It's, it's not only the, uh, the design and initial setup cost to construct, it's the life cycle cost to maintain and operate. And then it really comes to the architecture for the purpose of the mission you want. For the, the building of the space station, the shuttle was the ideal truck to, to haul those components into orbit. Uh, you could do the same thing and build a, a, an in-space craft that then transfers itself over to the moon or Mars. Um, certainly that's all doable. It's just what architecture do you want and what's the best way to get there. Um, if you run all those trades and you do all the math and you do the science, um, the shuttle as a, as a carrier, heavy lift capability, doesn't necessarily lend itself to be the, the most economical or the most feasible. There are other ways to go. But then again, you have to trade the, the design cost. And then there are the intangibles that we'd like to talk about too is just the uh, – the familiarity of the system, the known, the known hardware. You talk about the. Uh, you said the vehicles are old. Yet it's true they are 30 years old, but they are not old at all. They uh, they're in fantastic shape. They fly perfectly, uh, and uh, and they do exactly what we what we mean them to. We just don't have the budget to continue to keep doing that plus more plus expand beyond low Earth orbit. So at some point you just have to balance your book and decide what to do next. Um, ideally, I think yeah, we would have all loved to have kept flying shuttle while we set up the new system and we just transition from one right to the other and move on nice and, and smoothly. We just don't have the budget to do that. Um, and that's the, the reality of the world we live in. I don't know if you guys want to oh, chime in on that or not. I saw an alternate uh, escape system that was being uh, either tested or they were preparing to test 
which instead of having a uh, launch escape tower, would have uh, rockets underneath and would remove the capsule from the top of a rocket. I was wondering if that could be applied to the shuttle cabin and uh, without ha you know, a lot of, uh, uh, I don't know how I should say it, but uh, without affecting uh, too much the payload capability. We looked at it in the past. We looked at adding, I don't remember, in the 90s, we looked pretty extensively at adding an escape capability to the orbiter, and it was pretty invasive from an overall standpoint. It required a lot of modifications to the crew compartment. It required the extractor rockets or pusher rockets to be there. It had some separation planes. It was a, a tremendous amount of work to modify the vehicle, and then it was going to do what Mike talked about. It actually impacted dramatically the, the cargo and carrying capability, which wouldn't allowed us at that point if we would have done it to build space station because we truly needed all the cargo capability to get station built with the large modules we carried so when we looked at it then it was a extensive amount of cost a lot of redesign activity lots of analysis and then you, you ended up with a vehicle that, that really lost a lot of its payload care carrying capability and one final and quick question and what about uh, building a rocket based on the current architecture instead of reinventing the wheel from scratch uh, it's certainly possible, and it, like I said, that's in the trade space of, of designs. You could you could design a, uh, any system you wanted based on any architecture, what propellant you use, what size engine you use, how big the upper stage is, how big the, the main core stage is, whether you use solids or liquids. All that can be traded. It kind of it depends on what the variable you want to optimize for. Are you trying to optimize for design cost, life cycle cost? Um, are you trying to design for mass to LEO, mass to the moon? It, it pick the variable you want, and you can you can – crank out any answer you want and so uh, you know the shuttle was built back when the, the equation was said build the, the the maximum cargo capability you can to a low earth orbit if you're going to go back to the moon you saw with the Ares 1 Ares 5 type design that type of mission usually dictates that you need a higher mass to for a tr to, to, to throw at the moon so for translunar injection you'd design a different system but it's, it's Stefan it's certainly a possible design that you could use shuttle existing architecture to go build a, a heavy lift vehicle. The shuttle itself is a heavy lift vehicle. It's just carrying the orbiter as most of its payload. And, and there's several study teams in exploration that are looking at those various trades right now. I think there's a request for information that got sent out to industry. There's some meetings going on in Galveston, I think even uh, today and, and tomorrow maybe, uh, that are actually starting to look at those trades to figure out what the overall right uh, next generation of vehicle we need is and and clearly in that trade space is some stuff that would use capabilities from the shuttle things that we've done processing capability here and we'll try <coughs> to figure out the right overall system and get that brought forward through those state through those trade studies Thanks. Marcia. um marcia dunn associated press with two questions the first for any of the panel um if you were listening to mission control as the shuttle was running down the runway, which maybe you weren't, but there was a real sense of finality with the commentator going through 25 years, 32 flights, 120 million miles, history books. I'm wondering, certainly some of you must have been struck with thoughts of that today as you saw Atlantis come home. And I'm just looking for some, well, some words on that. You know, I, I, I was not listening to mission control. As a matter of fact, I was outside watching the, the landing itself, but... But, uh, yeah, I think we were all struck by the fact that that might have been the last landing of Atlantis, and, and that's probably why I mentioned what I did up front in my, in my comments. It, it, uh, it's a very, very special thing to, to see a reusable spacecraft land, get turned around, launch again, land, turn around, launch again. And we've been doing this for 30 <coughs> years, and so there, there's not just a, a, a technical fascination with it and an appreciation for it. There's an, there's an emotional tie to it. And... Um, uh, we all have that, and I think we'd be kidding ourselves if we, if we denied that. Um, but Mike put it exactly right. I mean, it, the budget is what it is, and, and uh, the next mission will dictate the architecture of that vehicle, whatever that may be. I just hope it comes quickly. And probably for Bill, um, given that the shuttle program is going to be around a little bit longer, uh, at least toward the end of the year, if not into next, um, when do you expect to be making decisions on where the shuttles wind up regarding museums? Yeah, I think, again, that decision is coming probably at the end of June, sometime in July. Uh, 
is what we're thinking about, and that really hasn't changed too much. We'll, we'll see what happens. I mean, first of all, the first thing we're doing is we're going, again, through the manifest with the remaining two flights to figure out how we <laughs> want to optimize, pick the right dates and some things there. You know, we've got September and November planned, but we'll go ahead and refine those as we go through, look at overall, how we can best put station in the absolute best configuration, see some tweaks if we've got to move some things and try to move the, some things around. So we'll do that activity first, and then the other piece is the museum kind of piece probably comes sometime in the middle of that after we've really finalized how we want to really effectively use these vehicles. Is there a meeting date for when you're going to look at the manifest as it remains? There, we, there, we don't have a specific meeting date. We'll work it through our normal processes, through our normal boards and panels. What we've told the teams is if they come, we're processing for September 16th for the next flight. And what we told the teams, if there's any negative work or you're starting to do things that don't make sense, if, you know, if you're getting a cargo ready that doesn't really make sense for that flight and you need it a couple more days or we ought to go redo the manifest, <coughs> we told those teams to come forward to both the station and the shuttle program, let them know. And at that point, we would convene the right folks together and do the right thing. So, so we're kind of aiming for September 16th, but we're being open to suggestions to see how we want to optimize things. And we're telling folks to be mature and tell us if they see anything that they want optimized they want changed and they can tell us and then we'll go ahead and see what we can do from an overall manifest standpoint to leave station in the absolute best configuration and take the absolute best advantage of these precious resources we have in the remaining flights i can give you a, a, an example that uh, we just had a meeting last week or this week beginning of this week um, for discovery that just came back from its last mission you remember one of the tiles on the rudder speed brake had cracked and fallen off uh, and they looked at it and, and, and looked at it, and it, it turns out we have a few of those that crack every mission, and it's the acoustics and the, and the, the rudder speed brake itself vibrates a little bit, and sometimes those tile bang into each other. So we sent the teams off together, a whole bunch of data, did a whole bunch of measurements, both in the open and the closed position, measured tolerances, uh, do a whole bunch of micro-inspections, and they came back with a plan to, to do even further detailed inspections and to shave those tiles back to, to the gap that they're supposed to be. Uh, just to help improve the chances of, of cracking tiles, or I should say lessen the chances of cracking a tile. We don't want to improve the chances. Um, and so they brought a, a series of work, and it was about 44 tiles, and it was going to take about 45 days. And if you look at the flow remaining to get out the door for a, a 916 launch, that was making them a little nervous for that amount of tile work. Uh, and so we asked the tile team to go back and prioritize that list in a, if you're going to do it in chunks, which is your high priority, which is your second priority. And they did that. So we're going to go bite off that first chunk right now. And if we find in June or July that we really do want to move the manifest, we can go grab some more work. So that's the kind of thing we've been setting the teams up to do is kind of, as you're doing some of this work, if you can put it in a priority order, that'd be great. Uh, and if you do find things that just make it sound like that's the wrong thing to do, bring that forward to management. James? James Dean from Florida today. Uh, Mr. Chris Mario, you've talked about wanting to make a decision by next month on whether or not Atlantis may in fact fly again. Can you explain what is going to change between now and then to justify adding a flight and, and that cost? And specifically, I'm wondering if it's going to take a determination from you or, or your program managers that the station, uh, or at least its ability to, to maintain six crew would be at risk without getting additional additional logistics and stuff up there because of COT CRS de delays or, 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 or what would be the needed to make that decision and say we have to do this? Yeah, I, I think in reality we have probably most of that data really in front of us now and, and what we're doing is we're presenting that data to the decision makers and the managers above us to, to let them take a look at that data and weigh it. You know, there's a cost associated with extending the shuttle into next year in terms of dollars that have to come from some program someplace. We can show the benefits that we provide from a, you know, a workforce transition standpoint that are real, that help us with keep some critical skills around, let us make some decisions smartly. We can show what cargo we can specifically carry. I can show you exactly how that will benefit the station in the future. It makes things better, but does it make it, it's, there's nothing there that says it's mandatory to go do that. If there was, we would bring that forward. But it clearly can improve things and put us in a much better posture. So we're kind of putting all those logical arguments together as much as we can, showing the, the downsides to folks and then providing it to the decision makers with the intent that we'll get some kind of decision. And, and what's really kind of forcing the decision for me is it's, it's difficult for us if we just keep kind of staying in limbo. You know, we need to really get some plans in place so people can make some real decisions with what they've got to go do with careers and other things, uh, also hardware plans. So we can't stay in limbo forever. So we really want to try to get that decision if we can, if we can get it arrived to in the June timeframe. And, and that's what we're trying to go do. 
So there's not going to be a there's not a big eureka or a big thing <coughs> that's coming forward that's going to say this is it. The, the data is there. It's pretty it's pretty compelling. It needs to be looked at and evaluated. But there is the cost, and again, it comes down to the funding issue. It, it, as a, just a follow up, in, in your opinion, obviously it would be better for the station to get whatever it can. In, in your opinion, or anyone else's opinion, is is it necessary to make that flight? Um, you know, for unless it's just absolutely impossible, there's no chance of getting the money. Is it? Can you convey kind of on the scale of you know how important how how much you think is needed? Very you know a little bit or a lot. You know um, how much you would like to have that flight if you can get the money. Yeah, yeah, yeah you know yeah, yeah. It, that's a tough one because like like Gers laid out that that you know it, there's nothing in there that says it's a mandatory, um, and it's hard to at, at a certain level you have to look at the downsides of of the cost and the budget and the the other work. And so, given the shuttle background that's sitting up here, we're going to say, yeah, you, we'd like to fly that mission, but it does cost the agency something, and, and that's the hard trade to make. So I don't think we can really go there because that's not our decision to make. That's like Gersh said, we're going to take that data forward and let the folks who make those decisions decide if that's worthy or not. Uh, so it's a whippy answer for you, James. Sorry. <laughs> Uh, Chris Gebhardt with nasaspaceflight.com. Uh, start with an easy one. Uh, the aircraft that photographed uh, Atlantis today during her re-entry, uh, were you originally planning to use that aircraft to photograph her um, like as baseline for boundary layer stuff, or was it just something that came up with a gap filler and you had the plane available? No, we actually had planned this ahead of time. The, uh, the Cast Glance aircraft uh, from, from Langley and the High Thorn team was, uh, was scheduled. We had... Um, we had had some money in the budget. We, we wanted to definitely keep them online when we do this boundary layer transition DTO. Um, and we ended up, because we landed uh, on the first day with Discovery on its last mission, we had a little extra money that we had budgeted for that aircraft team that we didn't end up needing. When we switched to an ascending node, on the, or descending nodes rather, on the, on the last mission, we were able to deploy ground-based assets, in, 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 which saved us some money. And so we looked at the budget, and the team said, hey, we can give you another flight for the money you've already paid us. And so they came online and were ready to go today. It was just a coincidence that we had the gap filler, giving them something to look at. And uh, I guess not to beat a dead horse here, but uh, with, with the 335 potential 135 flight coming, I, I guess ne next year, I'm, I'm just wondering what the realistic chances are of Atlantis actually retaining that the 135 flight if it becomes a reality in June of next year, given, um, you know, some of the like wing leading edge spar inspections and stuff that you have to do on her um, or that you're planning to do on her to, to make sure she's ready to go on this. And just wondering from a technical standpoint, if there are ideas or proposals out there that say, you know, if the, if, if the 335 and 135 schedules slip a little further, if it makes more sense to switch that to discovery instead of Atlantis. Yeah, the teams are, are balancing all those trades and looking at all the options. There's, in addition to the processing that has to happen, you have to look at its where it stands in its uh, certification for time and life cycle, um, where all that where that falls in the teams here at Kennedy. Um, and basically, there's about as many options as you, even though there's only two flights left and one launch on need, there's, there's about 15 options as to how you could lay all that out. And again, you kind of, just like we were talking about with the how you pick a launch vehicle architecture, you kind of have to pick the variable you want to optimize on. Um, you know, folks have been thrown out that, well, if you're going to go back, you want a, a Spitz vehicle so you can get a long lifetime on station. Well, we just flew a, a mission here with Atlantis without that capability, and it was a perfectly acceptable mission with three EVAs, got everything done it needed to. So it kind of all depends on what the content of that mission is. So once we kind of get a little more definition, we'll be able to then lock in some of those variables and start making decisions. It's kind of exactly what Bill was talking about. We, we don't want to let it go too much longer because at some point we do have to tie some of those down and start deciding. You know, you know I think I'd add that it's really important we focus on the two flights we've got remaining, right, and make sure that those are really well thought out and really well executed. This other thing is we don't want to get distracted, take our eye off the ball, right, and then end up not doing something. Or if we get too clever, trying to move work around, move things around from vehicle to vehicle, right. I've seen us get in trouble many, many times. So we, we've got a pretty stable plan. We're going to make small modifications to that plan where it makes sense, but we're going to really focus on the two remaining flights that are for sure and make sure we really have got those executed the best we can, and then we'll see what happens on this on this last plan. 
Yes, yeah, so I was just going to say, you guys are beating the dead horse, so I'll, I'll steal something from Mike from a press conference ago that said, you guys are the ones talking about the launch on E-Flight way more than we are. <laughs> We've got it bookend, we know what we're doing, and we're just waiting for direction. So. Uh, and, and on that exact note that uh, Mr. Gersenmeyer was mentioning, um, it's been a while since orbiters have been in sort of an extended flow between missions and with Endeavor's last flight coming in February and the 134 flight currently in the November-ish time frame. Uh, I'm, ju I'm just wondering, with Endeavor, Endeavor's original schedule for this had her being done with processing for 134 around mid-June and then mating it out to the pad. So um, what what type of work gets done on Endeavor now um, if, if she's basically done with processing for 134 if the original timeline held? Well, let's see. She's not, she's not done processing to begin with. Uh, the launch date that we're looking at for Endeavor is sometime in November, probably late November. So we're, we're, we're nowhere near done processing. Uh, if it does move out a little bit, uh, we'll, we'll take the processing flow and extend it out. Maybe we go to one shift power on testing a day instead of two. Might take Saturdays and Sundays off instead of working most Saturdays, that, that type of thing. We would just take the existing flow milestones, existing work, and, and basically spread that out. Um, we, have to, we have to be careful about adding too much work. Uh, I think you heard from both Mike and Bill that can get us in trouble if we have more time. We're all engineers. We like to change things, right? Um, <laughs> But we have to be careful that if we start adding stuff to fill in that time, we might be doing more harm than good. So typically what we would do is just, just take the existing work and, and simply spread it out. Hi, Clara Moskowitz with Space.com. Um, I think this is for Mike Moses, but maybe anybody. Um, this, this mission seemed to go very cleanly, uh, very few problems, and most of the objectives were met, as far as I understand. Just wondering, if this does turn out to be Atlantis's last flight, does that feel like an especially nice note to go out on? Oh, yeah, definitely. Yeah, I mean, we talk about that all the time, that the best thing that can happen is the uh, the propulsion elements, the, the, the boosters, the tank, uh, the main engines, the orbiter, all of that performs as it should, and, and it becomes, basically come, becomes out of the way, and it's nothing that we need to worry about when we're in orbit. And the team can do the mission, execute the EVAs, pull off the transfers, and this is, we had a little bit of a hiccup here with the, the cable on the boom uh, sensor system that, that got stuck, which kind of inhibited, inhibited our ability to, to do some of our inspections on flight day two, but we were able to kind of work that back in on a, on a pretty low interference basis. But to be able to stay out of the way and let the mission be executed is, is the best thing, and, and having Atlantis be able to do that was, was, is a good way to go. Also, just quickly, um, I'm wondering, with the addition of the new MRM-1, um, does anybody have a percentage figure on how complete the space station is at this point? We, we can get it for you. I'd, if I just quoted it to you, it would be wrong. So <laughs> we'll, we'll get it for you, and, and we can yeah. provide it to you. We, we do both by mass and volume now, and we can give you both of those. Thanks. Um, Irene Klotz with Reuters. Um, for Bill Gerstenmeyer, I just had a clarification about this, uh, the funding for this um, uh, STS-135 issue. If uh, you've got enough money in the budget to go through February, I think is the last time period um, we were told, and if you're able to fly the 133 and 134 flights on, on schedule, do you need something else, some other approval, I guess from a, uh, a Soyuz rescue or something else that would um, give this uh, decision about flying an extra flight um, somewhere beyond your your level? Well, well, right now, you know, we we have in the president's budget that he's recommended an additional uh, six hundred million dollars that allows us to fly through December through the end of the calendar year. That's been proposed to us in the budget that still needs to be approved by the authorizers and the appropriators and within Congress to actually make sure that money gets transitioned to us on October 1st. So that needs to occur. And then the problem is between December and, and uh, June or whenever we decide to fly this other flight, we need to keep the workforce around. We need to keep contractors in place. We need to be ready to do failure analysis. We need to have all the the shuttle test equipment and folks around to go support all that activity, and we do not have funding for that period. So you're you're saying that under no under any you're, you don't have any scenario where if 133 and 134 fly on time, you'd be able to do a 135 flight by February when you still have funding available, according to what John Shannon said recently. Well, again, if we get the 600 million, we could potentially go look at all that. But then again, we now have to 
step back a little bit and look at what we've done from an overall manifest standpoint, right? Have we, have we pushed things so far forward that we really haven't helped station? And, and a piece of the problem is we're going to have ATV uh, flying in December, and then we're going to have HTV flying in January. Those are both heavy cargo missions. So if I, if I did what you described, then I've got almost too much cargo at station from the wrong kind of vehicles at the wrong time that I can't fully effectively utilize the cargo that I'm mm -hmm. delivering to station. So we want to move that other flight in February somewhere later in the year, later in the spring, in the summer, away from those two progress from the ATV and the HTV cargo flights, such that we can get the right balance of spares to station, see what's failed on station, bring the last components up, bring the last research up, and return research at the most opportune time for station. So it's, it's kind of a finessing thing, but at some point it, it needs to be finessed if we want to really take advantage of what we're asking folks to go do and fly vehicles and, and hopefully that helps a little bit and and where where John was with with the February flight is we think we can do that if we can continue to underrun and continue to save some money within the program there's not a guarantee that we can get there we're working a bunch of options to try to be prepared to keep options open and and then we've but again as I've been stressing this at some point we've got to quit working options we've got to kind of then write them all down on a piece of paper get serious and get ready and go execute and um for the 133 and 134 flights, I guess for um, my uh, line back, um, uh, um, the boosters, the last set of boosters are coming in tomorrow. And if you could just kind of go through other milestones maybe coming up over the next, um, uh, I guess through the summer uh, as to where you are with processing. Thank you. Well, some of it depends on, on you know, the exact launch dates. We're shooting for September 16th. Uh, we still have, oh gosh, another couple of months in the OPF, something like that. I don't have those exact dates in front of me, I'm sorry. Uh, but yeah, the last set of boosters for the last flight are coming in tomorrow, so that'll be another milestone in the remainder of the program. Um, we can get you all those dates, Irene. I'm sorry, I just don't have them. And, and then quickly, I, on the percentages, they, they gave me a note here, it's 98% volume and 94% by mass. Sounds like an engineering answer. <laughs> Hi, Robert Perlman with CollectSpace.com with a question, I think, from Mike Leinbach. Um, you mentioned that uh, processing for Atlantis for the launch on need uh, starts tonight, but um, given that there is a, an extension on uh, on when those the last two, well, the last flight may fly, um, what's going to be the pace for the turnaround of Atlantis? Are you going to run it on a normal um, pace and just have her ready to sit in the in the OPF when needed, or are you putting out over time. Thanks. Well, that's a good question. The, the, the pace to begin with a processing flow is always the same. It's deservicing the, the vehicle from its, you know, from its previous mission. So we'll start that tonight. There are some commodities we have to get off before, before too long. We have a certain time and cycle requ uh, time requirements to get those, those commodities off. We have to purge the engines, got to get them dry. Those, those types of things always occur at the same time in a processing flow. And all that kind of stuff is done in the first week, essentially. Uh, and then we go into the turnaround. We get the, the payload down uh, load going on, uh, get, the, get the cargo bay, the payload bay emptied out, whatever may be in there. Those types of things are factored in, different systems testing. Um, and then hopefully we'll know by the end of June or so whether w what launch date we're looking for, whether it's a launch on need or whether it's a mission and, and what those dates may be. And, th and then we would set the remainder of the, of the OPF flow and pad flow for that. But the first, the first couple of weeks of a turnaround are always the same, and we'll, they'll start that tonight. Okay, thank you. And um, I think for, uh, for Bill Gerstenmeyer, um, it, with regards to the launch on need, it, is the current crew, the STS-132 crew that came back, is its flight deck crew that, that crew for Atlantis as well, or has another crew been set for launch on need? Thanks. We haven't made a decision at all about crew selection. Bill Harwood, CBS. So just a couple of quick ones for Bill. Uh, just to follow up earlier questions, who who is it? Who is the higher authority that has to approve it? Is this is it OSTP or is it the president that ultimately has to say let's do this, and then Congress has to give you the money? How does that work? It's really all of those folks that you described. This is the same kind of answer I gave last time, right? But it's it's they all have to agree kind of on the plan, and they all have certain aspects of the plan they have to approve, and I need all those approvals to, to be ready to go move forward. So when you say you guys are presenting the information, you're actively presenting that, I'm assuming, right now to OSTP and, OM and OMB 
uh, whoever the responsible parties are. That's in work, is what you're saying? We've, we've prepared some concepts, and we've got some data available that folks can go look at. Um, and one more on, on, on money and what it would cost. I mean, John had said it's $200 million bucks a month, you know, to run the shuttle program normally. Um, if you ended up having to launch 134 in February, for example, um, and you – well, even take that out of the equation. If you were looking at launching another mission in June, or is it really – for my ballpark purposes, is it just two hundred million a month between the end of the year and whenever that flight would fly? We we think it's possibly a little bit less than that, uh, and and we're still kind of working at and refining it uh, to get a precise number. It depends a little bit on what we actually how this thing transpires over the next couple of months, what our manifests are. But but we think we can probably be a little bit less expensive than two hundred million a month. And for Mike, uh, you mentioned standing out on the runway looking at the vehicle. I mean, you guys down here at the Cape who work on these things, I mean, what were your thoughts on a, <coughs> I don't know, a personal level um, as you saw this vehicle that is clean as it is, knowing that its next step is a museum? What, what, did, what did you think about when you look at that thing? Well, I'm, I'm first and foremost proud to be a member of the space shuttle team. Um, employee of NASA comes to mind. Um, the, the thing that strikes me most probably lately is that at the end of the shuttle program and, and before the next program is up and running, uh, there's going to be a gap in American space flight on American vehicles. That's a fact. And, and we just don't know how long that's going to be. And uh, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not opposed to the new program at all. Don't get me wrong. I just, uh, as a taxpayer and as a, as a space aficionado, both space travel and space adventure, um, the gap, that gap in American space flight on American, rocket, on American rockets, um, uh, it bothers me a little bit, um, but it is what it is, and, and we'll deal with that, and we'll, we'll wish all the commercial provi providers the best and help them in any way we can to get them up and running as soon as possible, uh, but that gap is unavoidable, and uh, I just hope we do what we can as soon as we can to narrow that gap as much as possible. Um, but to see that vehicle out on the runway and, and uh, knowing it may have been her last mission, um, kind of emotional. I think you saw, you saw some people out there that looked up at her and kind of had some second thoughts about was this really the end of the Atlantis uh, mission or not. Hi, Ken Kramer for the uh, Planetary Society. Um, for Bill Gerstenmeyer, I'd like to follow up on when the shuttle retires. And can you talk a little bit about how you're going to resupply the space station? Do you have enough capacity without the shuttle? You've got HTV and you've got uh, uh, ATV, but without... Um, if the COTS program doesn't doesn't happen, what what is the consequence of that? Yeah, again, we've we've done quite a bit of looking at the manifest. We have uh, ATV, HTV in progress uh, to supply the station. We're looking at both SpaceX and, and Orbital to be other cargo providers. We're looking for them to come in the 2011, 2012, 12 time frame from supplies. We've used these remaining shuttle flights to essentially outfit or or. Uh, provision the station with as many components as we possibly can. So for example, our large control moment gyros, they're already on space station, they're already pre-positioned. We just did the battery change out on this flight, which was a unique set of batteries that we got up and replaced those. So they're going to last all the way through 2020, 2025 potentially. So that's a good thing we've done. We also saw the large KU band antenna that went up, the SGANT that got attached. That provides a backup communication system for the KU system. So we have redundancy we've added there. So what we've done over this period is we've essentially pre-positioned station to fly for an extended period of time to the 2011, 2012 timeframe until the COTS providers come online. And then we'll be ready to go ahead and, and move forward with, with them supplying station along with ATV, HTV, and continuing then operating station. We've also seen, luckily so far, fairly low failure rates on station in terms of components. So that's very promising to us because that says we maybe need less logistics than we had budgeted. So that also gives us some margin. It may allow us to even take a little bit later date for some of those commercial vehicles coming online. So, so we've looked at that. We can, you know, we have a period of time when we can wait for them to gain experience to, to learn to deliver cargo to station. But, but we're going to need them in the 2011, 2012 time frame to keep station as productive as it needs to be to, to actually do the utilization that we want to go do. So, so they really are critical to us. We're looking forward to their success as they move forward, but we've got a little bit of margin if they're a little bit delayed, but, but not a tremendous amount of margin. So about a year or two is what you have? Yes. 
Okay. Could I follow up one other question too? There's been some discussion of uh, of uh, continuing an ARIES flight test program. Can you talk a little bit about that? What what you're doing, or is that all just congressional it, suggestions? Well, that's really more in the exploration systems mission directorate. You know, they kind of do the new development activities, and I do the the operational programs, the programs that are flying. So I don't really have much insight into where that planning is. But I I do know there's several teams out there looking at various options that we're trying to to put together an, a vision for what that next plan is with some concrete milestones and concrete vehicles and missions. But I I don't have specifics of that. Peter Aylwood, Southern FM in Australia, for Mr. Gerstenmeyer. Um, when the Space Shuttle program eventually finishes, whether it's two or three missions from now, could you tell me what um, the Astronaut Corps will actually be doing other than those assigned to uh, ISS duties or planning to? Will they be involved in the next generation development or? Yeah, the, the astronaut office will do its uh, kind of traditional role. They'll, they'll be definitely supporting space station. They'll be very active with, with the space station activities, doing research, understanding what we're doing there. The astronaut office is also typically very involved in design of the new vehicles, so they are involved in uh, uh, training analysis, uh, human factors kind of interaction with the vehicle. They're also involved in systems design, uh, looking at things. You know, I came to the shuttle program, you know, a little bit before the first shuttle flight, so the astronauts were involved at that point, designing and helping to work with the engineers to go um, operate the shuttle. They also spent a lot of time in the simulators doing early things in the avionics facility, understanding how the software worked, how the vehicle operates. Same with Space Station. They spent a lot of time in the design reviews and the activities associated with that. So there will be a, um, a portion of the astronaut office where we take their flight experience, what they really learned in, in space, what they understand to how to operate systems, what good form, fit, and function is from a human interface standpoint, and we'll capture all that knowledge so we can use that in the next vehicle. So the astronaut office will be involved both in supporting station and also designing and developing the new systems that we're going to go fly. And once again, post-shuttle, could you describe what the activities at Kennedy Space Center are going to be here? Is the whole place going to be mothballed until they know what's happening? And also, um, are there going to be mass layoffs and retirements? And can you give me numbers on on those, perhaps? I, I, again, we've got some workforce projections which we've shown for what the shuttle ramp down is. One of the things that's in the president's new budget is is an activity called the 21st Century Range or Launch Architecture. What we're looking at here at Kennedy is could we build some things that are not single-purpose kind of facilities? So, for example. In the vertical assembly building today, you know, we can process uh, shuttles in there, and then we processed Ares 1X in there, but that we had to essentially modify the High Bay 3 temporarily to support Ares 1X. The idea is could we, could we more generically make the VABs uh, uh, assembly facilities where you can have platforms and move up and down, so if a different rocket is in there, you could process a different rocket. So potentially you could even pick up some of the expendable launch vehicles that are currently launched over on the Cape side. You could process those there, go ahead and, and, and launch them in the high bay. They're also looking at a new launch mount, and maybe Mike can talk about that, but the launch mount it accepts different rockets on top of it. So again, it's a generic kind of launcher base that could be used with different rockets. So they're going to be positioning themselves to, to make the Kennedy Space <coughs> Center more of a multi purpose facility that's not specific to one program but can support multiple programs. Same thing with the range. It takes us 48 hours or so to turn around the range. That's because a lot of the data that gets passed over to the range is unique. It's in shuttle format. Then when they want to go fly a Delta, they got to switch to Delta format. So we need to figure out a way we can get some of that software fixed so we can make that transition from one rocket to another much faster. The software that controls the shuttle is unique to the shuttle. All the PC Gulf stuff is unique software. We built new unique software for Ares 1 next could we build some software that could actually monitor a variety of different rockets to try to make the launch complex more efficient so there's going to be quite a bit of effort looking at how we posture ourselves for the next generation to be kind of a multi-purpose ability to support multiple rocket time frame I think one of the most tangible things you'll see in the, in the near term is a change to pad B uh, we're going to take uh, all the structure off of pad B and make it essentially a clean pad and make it available, as Bill said, for different vehicle configurations. Obviously, leave Pad A alone. We're going to launch the shuttle off Pad A and, and probably leave it alone for some time after that um, in case the next architecture is a shuttle-derived type architecture, which, which I don't know right now. Uh, but, that, but that's the next thing you'll see is, is Pad B starting to come down 
um, because you know like the, mo the mobile launcher that we have for the Ares test program with, with, the, with the tower on that mobile launcher, uh, that's their configuration. Some other vehicle may have a different configuration, but most of what we're hearing is they would prefer just to have services out at the pad, but no structure at the pad. So they could design their own mobile launcher and, and their own tower to fit their configuration. So we're going to get pad B down to essentially a clean pad concept, and uh, you'll, you'll start seeing that pretty soon. Eben Brown, Fox News Radio. Um, since the uh, return to flight after Columbia, we've always had a launch on need uh, ship ready to go in, in case. Um, if there is a 135 flight, there would not be an LON flight, I'm, I'm understanding. Why is that an acceptable option? Is that something that's being – is there a decision or, or, or a conversation going on saying, well, we could forgo the LON just to get one more, uh, just to get one more flight going? What we're we're looking at is we're looking at provide we if we can make the crew size a four crew size keep the crew size small, you could potentially use a Soyuz vehicle to return the crew in a period of time so you can achieve the same uh, launch on need backup capability with a Soyuz vehicle. Uh, it may require a fair amount of time on orbit. Then the other piece of data that goes into this is we're also taking a look at the performance we've been seeing on the external tanks, right? What are we really gaining? What protection do we gain by having another orbiter available for us to go do that? So we're looking at it logically. You know, have our, has our tank performance improved? You know, we now have repair techniques that we've certified or not certified, but we've validated in the arc jet to make sure that we can repair damage on the shuttle. So are those things mature enough now that we would be willing to not totally forego the launch on need capability, but relax it and provide it in a slightly different manner using Soyuz and the robustness of our repair procedures in our, in our tank performance. So it's, and that's a piece of the discussion that we have to have. We need to get, again, the community to go agree that that's an acceptable approach. But we've laid out the parameters and we're starting to evaluate those things now. The other big piece of that, just the station robustness, you know, when we first started this at Return to Flight, we were looking at a 30-day lifeboat capability on station. Those systems are now up and fully running, and, and we're looking now at 120 days. And by the time we get to the end, we're probably going to be up in the 150 days that, that a crew could stay up there before they need to be rescued. So that really brings a lot of other options to the table besides a, a launch on each shuttle. That's exactly so right. would, um, in a situation like that, would a lifeboat need to be standing by at station in that case, or would you send a lifeboat up should you need one? We, we would yeah. probably send one up should we need one. And in the form of a so use or yes. something. Okay. <clears throat> then a few follow-up before we wrap up here. Doc, just work your way down the, I guess, same order. I'll be the cleanup man. Okay. <laughs> before, sure. Marsha, that's fine. Uh, Marsha Dunn-AP again for Bill. Um, I'm with the Falcon test coming up within a week or so. How, how crucial do you think it is to the whole current plan as it stands um, for that flight to be successful? Again, I think it's, it's, Im it's important, but it's not – This is but tough, right? Bill's it, dancing with – it's the maiden flight of a new rocket, right? So yes. it's important, but you don't want to then make that mean it must be successful. It, a, a test flight, by definition, doesn't have to go to orbit to be successful. It just has to, you have to learn what it's doing and understand it so you can successfully repeat your capability. And so I think Elon yeah. said it best, he doesn't have any expectation that they'll, on their first launch countdown, push the button. I mean, they're going to learn something as they go. That doesn't mean they, they, they weren't. But you saw that in, in their wet dress rehearsals that you learn incrementally. And so as you go, you kind of learn. So we saw that with Aries 1X too. We got this extra pressure put on that program to say, well, it now has to work perfect. Well, it's a test flight. It's not supposed to work perfect or it wouldn't be a test flight. There's a reason this first flight isn't carrying up a, a Dragon capsule taking cargo to the station. It's the internal SpaceX. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's where we try to not want to put that pressure on them to say, hey, you better get that right because the next one's carrying our stuff. Uh, it's their test program. They can do what they need to and they ought to meet their own objectives. So. And, and I think that's that's really important. What I was trying to say, and I, I probably won't say it right, but but even if it appears that it's successful, it's not necessarily that ensures that you're there. It's really the data behind it, right? How how well did the vehicle perform against its margin, right? And and how well did other things go? So it may give the appearance that it was successful, but then it's really deeper than that. But then on the counter or the other side is also if you have a failure, and it's a very clean failure, and you understand what it was, and it's it was very obvious to you, you can repair that and then build a much better robust design so it actually could benefit you. So there's, there's a, 
So the problem with test flight is, as engineers, we want to test at the right time in the sequence. If you wait until everything's perfect, then you're not really doing a whole heck like by doing a test flight. You know, you kind of knew it was going to be okay in the end, and you really didn't learn what you wanted to go do. If you go too early and you pick up some failure, then you get all this help in redesigning your rocket, right? So then you've got to pick the right time between when it's too early in the test sequence and when it's too <coughs> late that you gain the maximum out of that test flight, and, and that's, the, that's the dilemma. And it's the same philosophy that goes into aircraft testing testing it goes into other testing as well so it's not an easy answer to me it's what does the performance of the rocket actually tell us about the design and then that moves forward and then it's best to talk to the designer or the builder of the rocket about what this test flight really means to them oversight over it whatsoever are you going to have people stationed in mission control to to make sure things are this this first right. flight is is not sponsored by nasa it's for another customer so this is pretty much spacex doing their thing they've asked us to help so we have uh, we're going to help pick up the first stage so we're going to use one of our uh, recovery booster recovery ships to help them with the recovery of the stage uh, again and then we've also uh, i think they've asked for some camera assets and some radar assets so we're going to make those available to them too but it's kind of what what services they wanted from us they went out and asked us for help in these certain areas to help with their overall processing in a test flight and we'll gladly provide that help to them where it makes sense mm -hmm. james um mike Lombach, just following up on that um generic launch mount um is your expectation that crews are going to launch from Kennedy Space Center post shuttle, um, and if if so, when when do you think that that might happen next after the last shuttle flight? Um, that's a that's a real 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 good question, and I don't know that anybody has that answer. Um, I certainly don't. Where where crews are going to go from will be will be dependent on on their vehicle architecture. Um, whether they could launch from our from our pad is a possibility. Whether they will, I just don't know. Um, we'll just have to wait and see. I mean, there, there are different competitors out there that, that want to do that business uh, for America, and, and we'll, we'll pick between them. And it'll be their, it'll be their, their entire system will be designed based on, on their requirements. And does that fit our, our clean pad, or does it fit their existing pad? I, I don't know yet. I, I just don't know. I'm sorry. Um, Chris Gebhardt with NASASpaceFlight.com. Um, in terms of the... Uh, RCC imagery from the OBSS on, on this flight. Um, when exactly did you have all the uh, imagery you needed to clear the RCC? Um, did, was it after the images were taken of Atlantis during the e first EVA, or was it really not until the, uh, the final inspection? Let's see. It, it, I, I'll try to slice that into, into the, the big picture draw with a crayon box says it was after late inspection. Uh, they got all the imagery that they are used to having in order to clear the RCC. Um, but even with that, the LDRI, the, the laser dynamic ranging instrument that's on the end of the boom that gives us that 3D map of the, of the, the sensor or the, uh, the RCC surface has some limitations. And there are areas where we are at the edge of our detection criteria to say that that's a critical damage size that we need to pick up. And so that system's working at the, at the maximum extent of its capability. So even on a perfect mission where everything worked fine, when we say the RCC is clear, there's still a little risk there that some things that we, we don't have imaged 100% perfectly, uh, and we never really could. So, so it's kind of a, a it's a sliding scale to say when did we have it? Because then the other thing you could do is at what point was the risk now acceptable to say based on all the other assets besides just taking a picture of the wing? We have uh, all the accelerometers in the in the wing. We call it the wing leaning edge. Uh, detection system that, that would ring if it got hit by something on ascent. We have all the imagery, both ground-based and on board with the SRB cameras, the ET feed line cameras. We have the radar now with the debris radar to see if something fell off. So you pull that whole suite together and you say, did I get hit by anything? And all of that was telling us no. So, so while after flight day two, when we didn't quite get perfect coverage, um, was the RCC cleared for entry as a team? No, they weren't ready to say, we've seen enough to say there are no damages. But as a management team, we were comfortable enough to say, yep, but we are good enough to wait uh, and not need to go any further with that. So it's kind of, you buy off a little bit as you go. You're never perfect. It's where you're now at an acceptable level to say, I, I am comfortable with what I have. Um, the team was probably split about 50-50, whether we, we needed more imagery or not. The more we talked about it, the longer you wait, that other stuff comes in. The SRB film was delayed a day due to bad weather. We finally got that. The wing leading edge sensors guys came in and, and showed us some of the, the testing they've been doing recently to help validate the, the chance of a false negative signature. You didn't want to ever see 
uh, would it ever not tell you you got hit? And they did some great testing to show that it, the chances of having a false negative were almost nil, so, so we knew we could put a lot of confidence in that system. As that all came together, the confidence of the team went higher and higher. And so, so I'd say we didn't officially clear RCC until late inspection, but as a team we were probably mentally there about, uh, about halfway through the mission when we looked at all the rest of the data. Irene Klotz uh, with Reuters. Um, I, these are probably both for Bill. Um, if uh, if NASA is operating on a continuing resolution without a budget passed for the year beginning October one, um, at what point, if any, does um, would that start impacting what you do with shuttle and kind of station uh, completion? It, it depends. We need the specifics of what the continuing resolution means, right? Are we held at the Ten budget levels? Are we given the president's uh, proposed budget levels? Or are we given something in between? So it depends what budget levels we're given, uh, where it starts impacting us from a overall manifest standpoint. So again, our job is to, to kind of analyze those cases and then let the, the the budget folks know where those cases are. So then hopefully they can craft a budget that that lets us keep doing what we need to keep doing. But it's pretty. This is pretty typical budget cycle as we go through the fiscal year change. Thanks. And um, another uh, money question on the, uh, <clears throat> it's, it, you sound like really good neighbors uh, with SpaceX, but are they going to be reimbursing the government for the use of these uh, assets that you're making available? Yeah, we have a SpaceX agreement signed with them and there's... Uh, so it's, it's a marginal cost. We provide, they're not building the ship, we did that, but the fuel and the food and all the stuff, they, they do pay for that. Okay, I think Stephanie, you get the last question. Yes, uh, uh, one final question from me, uh, uh, which I should probably ask your bosses, too bad they're not here. But anyway, uh, and I'm not trying to get into demagoguery here, but um, talking of a gap, okay, uh, the Wall Street crooks got the trillions, and NASA's budget is one tenth or what it was in the mid 60s. I mean, uh, space flight is a status symbol and, uh, and also, Ameri obviously, uh, that makes America stand out. So without it, or, or by outsourcing uh, launches or not having a, a, a US spacecraft with uh, people aboard, is gonna make uh, the United States look like uh, is not as uh, as powerful as it was in the 60s. And uh, I'm wondering if, I mean, obviously, just your thought, as I said, I mean, you, as, as I said, it should have been your bosses or the boss of your bosses that I should be talking to, but I was wondering if you have any opinions. That's what I was saying. I, I, I'm not sure who's gonna wanna volunteer to jump under the bus. Um, but uh, you, apparently. Yeah, personally, <laughs> yeah, apparently me. Personally, I, I'd love to see us spend more. You know, half a percent of the budget uh, is what we spend now. I'd love to see that doubled or tripled, or uh, heck, I'd love to just be able to spend what they what they make in box office earnings off of some of the the major motion pictures. But the the, the reality is that's not happening. You know, we, you got everybody sitting up here, everybody you'll talk to as you walk around the center, not only pays their taxes and, and dedicates that to the space program, but they uh, they dedicate their lives to that the space program as well. So you're talking to an audience who who could give you probably no answer other than yes, please let us do more. We'll we'll show you a whole bunch of a really cool stuff and 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 uh, inspire the generations to come to go into into science and technology and math. You know, everybody talks about spinoffs from NASA. You know, did the Apollo program invent Tang? It doesn't really matter whether that answer is yes or no. What it did was spur a culture of of science and learning and education. It's it's an inspiration thing to have a, a goal. So from that standpoint, I'd love to see us continue because when I look at my kids, I, I wonder what to inspire them. This is what brought me along. That's not to say that redesigning a, a better tractor is what's going to inspire my kids. And so that's a great thing. We have to spend more money on agriculture. So it, I can give you an answer, right? But from a space program, you're not going to find any of us that work here who aren't diehard space enthusiasts. So yeah, I'd say we'd all love to see more budget. But then again, I could say that about my personal life too. So. <laughs> and I, I, think, I think the only thing I'd add is that, that, you know, we're tremendously blessed to get to do what we get to go do. I mean, all of us up here, this is as much of a passion for us as it is a profession. And uh, 
I, we may, we, we all want more, as Mike said, right? But I look at what we've got, and I am very thankful for what we have. I'm thankful to work with this team. I can't think of any individuals I would rather spend uh, my hours with than the folks I work with in this business. There are no more sounder professionals in the world. We'll take what we're given, and we will implement the absolute best program that we can implement with what we're given. Okay. And I guess just to follow up on the Tang question, the answer is no. Okay. Just <laughs> clarification thing. <laughs> Thank you. Um, that's uh, our last question. And our next briefing will be with the astronauts from Atlantis' SCS 132 mission. Uh, that crew news conference will start approximately 2.30 or 2.45 p.m. Eastern time, but for the exact start time, please stay with NASA Television. We'll put up a graphic as soon as we find out and we know the crew is available. In the meantime, uh, for more information about the SCS-132 mission, go to www.nasa.gov shuttle. Thanks for joining us.